Hello, Janok. Was that for me or them? Oh, there you go. So, uh, welcome to the security panel. Has everyone had a great Janok so far? Can I make you clap one? No, I'm kidding. Um, so, I'm going to start off by letting them introduce themselves. I'm Charles Edge. Uh, I don't know what I do at Champ, but I do something, I promise. And Jen? Uh, my name's Jennifer. I work for Capital One. I'm part of the uh, Macintosh engineering team. So we kind of do everything um, except fix printers. We let other people do that one. I never that. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, my name is Nick Smetna. I'm with Jamf. I've been with Jamf for about five years, and I'm one of the IT managers there. Hi, Ryan Merrick. Uh, with Sentinel One, been there for about eight months now, focusing on uh, strategic and architecture with uh, the endpoint. I'm Ross. I have uh, been with Ping for about five and a half years now. I currently work uh, doing um, managing more lab environments, but I did previously manage our Jamf environment and work on the help desk. <laughs> My team. <laughs> Wait till you see what they do later. <laughs> My name is Aaron Kimberly. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at Jamf, and this is my, my first year and my first JNOC, so I'm excited to be here. Thanks for joining us, guys. Um, so with these panels, I like to seed questions, so I have a bunch of questions, but we want to make sure to answer your questions in the room because they're far more important than what I think you're going to ask or thought you were going to ask a week ago. So I'll start with the first one, and in that, in the time that we're answering that. Um, if anyone wants to come up to the mics and ask questions, then I would be more than happy to call you instead of my silly questions. So the first question, which I'll key off to Sentinel-1, um, what is the biggest actual credible threat you see to Mac deployments? With Mac deployments being uh, like as far as deploying Macs within an organization? Yes. OK. Um, well. You have the users, of course. <laughs> uh, but but, but out, outside of that, uh, I'm um, glad you didn't say the admins. Right. Or you, no, we no, might have fruit no, coming I mean, out. Like, it, it's, it, it's interesting because I find most users are uh, executives or VPs that, oh, well, I need a Mac because it's the cool thing to have. Don't get me wrong, I, I have a Mac, I love it. Um, but definitely the users, and then you know, understanding, um, you know, how, how do we actually protect these devices from people clicking on the wrong things or going to these bad websites? But primarily the users is, is where I would start. And then educating them in how to do the right things. And I mean, when you can't do that or they don't listen, um, you, you know, that's, that's where we can try to help and help alleviate those threats that are being identified. Great. Anyone else want to key off that or riff randomly? Uh, go ahead. Oh, I was just, excuse me. I was going to say post-it notes as well. Um, that's my <laughs> biggest problem. And we computers. just gave a whole pack to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but there's not much room to write your password on those, so I think we're okay. Does Sentinel-1 block against post-it notes? Not yet. Okay. Might be a roadmap item. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Um, so I don't see anyone at the mics. I'll go ahead and continue with my questions. There was a bunch of uh, media around the DEP quote unquote vulnerabilities recently. So I thought we'd uh, discuss how severe the DEP vulnerabilities that we've seen since August. I guess I'll chime in. Um, I think for a lot of environments, it's a non-issue as long as you um, have authentication to your MDM server, obviously. Um, there's also ways to mitigate that issue with, you know, having it, you know, behind a firewall and, you know, whitelisting certain IPs, things like that. But um, the media, I think, has blown it up to be something, you know, it's obviously an issue, it's a real issue, but I think most environments are probably safe from this sort of thing. Well, I'd be curious, um, since we have a lot of champ admins in the room, yeah. who uses LDAP authentication with their DEP workflows? And who doesn't? And where do you work? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I also think with the vulnerability, it's well, some of them, some of it's 
OK, I guess, in the way of like we can you know, make a virtual machine that has a serial number and has the hardware identifier and be able to wrap a test. Yeah, that's a bit of a vulnerability that eventually Apple might patch. I, I, I did submit it one day to Radar, and they were like, well, we don't really care. But with that, it makes our jobs easier. So some of these vulnerabilities are good, but not all of them. And for what it's worth, the whole DEP thing or DEP thing, I'm not allowed to say anymore, but I thought I'd do that in case anyone from Apple wanted to cringe. Um, that's how we got screenshots for books. That's how we presented at conferences. That's, you know, we've yep. known about that forever. It's not like it's anything net new, it's just it happened to make the media. So um, we have a, our first user question. Hello? All right. Um, IBM mentioned yesterday that they let their users all be local administrators, which has actually surprised me quite a bit. And I'm curious what your opinion on that is. I have no opinions because I don't know everyone's background, but I would be curious. I, I think it's hit or miss. It depends on the user, right? So it depends what team you're giving it to. Uh, we generally actually allow everyone admins on their Macs but we don't on the Windows side. Um, if I had my way to push a change, I would probably get rid of it and go with you know, like, Rich, what, like the tool that Rich Open Source that uh, um, allows you to be admin for a temporary, a, bit, a temporary time. But other than that, it's, they're, they're going to blindly click, and if they want to get access, they're going to get access regardless if they have an admin account or not. I think you really, you really need to focus on defense in depth, right? There are a lot of use cases for local admin. Local admin is a classic security blunder, right? But for all that, there are definitely use cases where it's a valid reason for having local admin. Some of the institutional advantages of a Mac also make it a little bit less dangerous, but you need to look at the network layer and authentication and other components to kind of mitigate that a bit. Yeah, as Aaron said, and as you know too, at Jamf, everybody's a local admin, so I can't really talk bad about that, but. He brought up a great point as um, uh, mentioning that there's a fine, or there's a, it's tricky to get that mix of you know, great information security and also not infringing too much on enablement of your employees. And um, yeah, so there's obviously different schools of thoughts on that, but at Jamf we've adopted. I really don't want to have to reinstall a printer every time a user needs a new printer. Um, and granted, you can uh, hack the authorization DB so that you, you can give them access to managed printers or et cetera, et cetera, without being admins. But um, I've found that anytime a user is not an admin, the support costs go up. And treating users like they're your coworkers instead of your children often has them act like your coworkers instead of your children. <laughs> Miles Lacey. Hey there. So uh, yeah, I just want to tack on to that uh, admin question. When we look at um, Apple tools like system integrity protection, the various uh, security and privacy tools built into the OS, if we look at well thought out uh, MDM management and uh, required MDM management, uh, the fact that admin isn't what a lot of people think admin is under those paradigms. Um, you know, assuming you're, you've got your good practice tools and settings locked in place, what are the, the risks or uh, vulnerabilities you see with admin when you've got those bits buttoned up? I don't really see any. Um, we have mixed opinions uh, in, in my team about you know, how it should be done, but I agree that if, if you have all of your other tools and uh, rules in place, then you should be fine. The greatest risk, I think, for most of our users is that they're going to mess themselves up. They're going to ruin their own data. If they're willing to take on that risk, then that, that should be their responsibility. So it comes down to user education and making sure they understand what they're doing. Uh, but I think we can get our job done without being as concerned about that singular account. The Has anyone in the room accidentally installed malware by installing a Flash plugin or a browser plugin? Just Mac Keeper. Just Mac Keeper? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's just mean. Okay. <laughs> 
No vendor bashing, unless it's Mac Keeper. <laughs> Speaking of Mac Keeper, um, the next question is, do we actually need antivirus software on our Macs? Do you have an opinion, Ryan? I, I, I do. <laughs> um, I'll type my paycheck out, so it's a little different. But as far as, um, th there are a lot of things that, you know, can get past your, your traditional AV, but I, I, would, I would certainly encourage it. Um, and, like, last week I was at a conference doing demonstrations with, uh, like, I, I like using Empire. It's, you know, PowerShell, but now they even have Python in there, which is really cool because they have the listeners for, <coughs> Mac and, and Python, so you can do Linux and Mac. Um, but being able to do those things, I mean, just Python's running in the background. I'd be curious to see if you guys know that those are actually running on your boxes outside of, you know, the daily norm on what's on there. And they even have a listener that goes straight to Dropbox or OneDrive. So if you do allow those, guess what? That can be used as the proxy to identify or um, be the go-between to all of yours. So if you have Python on a Mac, which you do, um, and you're allowed Dropbox, then again, I'm going to send a payload, and you're probably not going to be able to identify anything, especially if you don't have anything detecting those things. So. Yeah, and like Miles said, um, you know, Mac OS has a lot of great built in features, SIP, Gatekeeper, and you know, things you can enforce with the Jamf Pro, and that's going to help out tremendously. But um, part of having some sort of malware protection, too, is just being a good internet citizen. Um, so where if you're sent a virus or something for Windows and you're on a Mac, you don't accidentally forward it or, or whatever to one of your coworkers or a vendor or someone else you have a professional relationship that does have a Windows machine. Um, so part of it's that, and part of it also having malware protection, in my opinion, is um, ensuring that certain things aren't happening on corporate-owned devices. So things like... Um, something that an antivirus might not typically stop, whereas some general malware protection um, would be useful, would be like stopping key gens, people installing key gens on their machines for whatever uh, software. So I still and think... And that's getting into anti-ransomware at that point, yeah, right? Right. Or your unapproved applications. Sure. Yeah. I think ultimately you have to make the decision one way or another. You can't just, just idle on the question of AV. There's lots of reasons to install it and not install it. There's reasons to question the definition and what applications fit where, uh, but you need to be willful about it. You need to, you need to think about it and your compensating controls and your ecosystem and decide whether AV fits. And does the fact that Apple has a built-in antivirus scanner with MRT impact that answer as far as third-party antivirus goes for any of you guys? I don't think it does. I think part of that answer is even vendor, other vendors that are contractually uh, uh, complying you to be into an a a antivirus don't see that as a solution. So when you have that at complex to the problem, then you have to have a third party regardless, be it you know, current gen or what they're now calling the next gen. So uh, what vectors do you see out there for ransomware? Speaking of key gens, I guess that would be the main one. Um, and how might we mitigate them? So 91% um, of all infections are email related. The, the remaining ones are probably accidental in most cases, internal file transfer or in fact, strange vectors like, I, I think this is malicious, so I'm gonna update it to my ticketing tool and thus transmit it to other people reading internal uh, help desk tickets. But ultimately email is the vector. Uh, and there are a lot of ways. In fact, it's, it's hard to have uncontrolled email at this point. So you have to have some reasonable set of controls combined with local user training, and you can broadly mitigate this issue down to a very manageable level. Jeff Compton. So I got a question for our friend from Sentinel. Um, I'm going to ask you to put on the hat to represent all security vendors right now. Um, I know it's a little tough, but um, so Apple has made it pretty clear that a day is coming in the future. We don't know when, but it is coming where access to the kernel is going to be no more. Are security software vendors ever going to even attempt to get out of the kernel? 
because CACs make our life really difficult. Every text you add onto the OS exponentially makes the system that much more unstable, unpredictable, hard to upgrade, et cetera. Sure. Uh, so with regards to that, uh, when and if it comes, we'll, we'll have to adapt. So for example, um, you know, one, one of the nice things that we have with our Sentinel One's Linux agent, and I, I unfortunately can't speak to all of them. I know some are kernel-based with regards to Linux, which is a pain because if you've ever updated Linux, it changes almost on every upgrade. We actually don't use a kernel um, for our Linux, so we have the capabilities and the knowledge. It's just figuring out, all right, when that change is, I, I see us being able to adapt for that because it's that important. <coughs> so, yeah. Just for my own curiosity, at that point, do you hook into every socket opening, or do you like actually build something that talks between each app? Well, for like Linux, for example, we're utilizing Audit D to feed us all that information, so that way we're we're not at the kernel level, but we're still getting all that information to perform remediations and detections based on what it is we're seeing. How we do it in the future, when that changes for Mac, is yet to be determined. Awesome. Good, good answer. Thanks. Next. Hi. Uh, Apple has been very pro-user choice about security and various things. How, what are your opinions on where the enterprise is making the choice as it comes down to network security, so like things like where Apple says you can't proxy us or you can't decrypt us or things like that, but at an enterprise level where privacy is not as important as you would be in like at a consumer level, what are your opinions there and how do you guys handle those things? Do you just let it out? <laughs> there are about 20 different answers to that question. Yeah. Um, so. Are we specifically talking about uh, certificate pinning and APNS type stuff, or? So the whole 17 slash 8, they basically say you can't proxy right. or default or decrypt. Like, do you guys just default route that out and let it? Because then that you can't do like any inspection there, really. I'm just going to field this because you got no choice. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what I think about it, that's just the way it is. You know, I, I don't know. Do you guys have any other? Comments. I mean, that class A is every device is owned by Apple, with the exception of a few contractors, and those are very highly vetted. I've had one of those IPs, and there, there's just no getting around that. That's their. That's that's the way it is. You know, I mean, but these sorts of things fit into the decision of whether companies allow Apple into their environments, right? But I think the era of authoritarian security is is kind of over, right? Security has to be business partners, and if there's a good business case for these devices, then these things all have to be manageable, right? There's, there's other ways to handle a problem. If you can't proxy or you can't terminate encryption on your load balancer for some reason, you, you just figure out ways to manage that. Um, I, I mean, I do understand, and I've, I've been on the phone with many, many, many companies uh, infosec departments who are like, but we have to inspect that. We, it, we do that with everything. And it's just not going to happen. You know. <laughs> Sorry, I wish I had a better answer. Rich Troughton. Let's see, everyone give an applause to Rich. I mean... All right, that's enough applause. Yeah. That was more than I got. <laughs> so with Apple's behavior over the past couple of years with regards to security updates, making it to, say, N minus 1 or N minus 2, it's very clear that Apple's focus is on, uh, for operating systems, N. And that's pretty much it. They're doing best effort, as far as I can tell, for N minus 1. It's kind of begrudging, as far as I can tell, for N minus 2. And specifically hash-based. Yeah. yeah. Um, how important do you think it is to get your environments on the shipping OS as rapidly as possible? Like, what, what methods, first of all, what do you think of the idea of just being like, the shipping OS is our supported OS and that's it? Versus we're going to accept the risk of running N minus one, N minus two, N minus however in our environment. 
depends on your situation. Um, I would prefer to be on the newest. Um, at the same time, I always prefer to be on the dot one personally, so other people can find the dot zero bugs and I don't have to worry about it. But that's just a personal choice. Um, but there's always, I think there's always going to be something on either side. So some, at some places, you're not going to be able to go to the brand new thing on day one because you have a security tool or you have a essential uh, application that you use and the companies aren't ready for. Um, last year, we had a situation where we had a, a, a fundamental um, networking issue. And so we had to wait for a release to come out. So we were kind of stuck from Apple on that point. but. It all depends on what your users need and what your company needs. If you force them to go up and they lose functionality, then I think any security or, or any features that you've gained are kind of wiped out. They're, they don't count anymore because your daily functionality has been lost. Russ? We do, uh, well, we try to do N minus one for the most part, um, but it's always, there's also the struggle of getting the user to actually do their upgrade uh, without hassling them to a point, and then for us to hassle somebody, we have to get some sign off from executive. Um, preferably, it would be all n minus one for us. Um, having the latest on everything, there are apps that still don't work to this day on um, more modern software. That, like we have documentation software that our docs people use every day, and they can't run anything past ten twelve on that, and that's because the vendor just, for whatever reason, hasn't updated. But when they do, actually, no, the vendor did update, but the new version of the software does a whole bunch of things that differently that they don't like. So they won't upgrade until you know, they're forced. And for what it's worth, I think Apple is accepting the fact that large enterprises need to defer updates, and so they gave us keys to do that. Right. So. And kind of as a follow-up, if your blocker is a security product. You're not talking about anyone on stage, are you? I'm talking generically. <laughs> Gen very, very generically, if a security product is what is your blocker, what do you think is the better strategy? Dump that security pro product that's actually compromising your security at this point? Or defer the 30, 60, 90, 180, 365 days until that vendor is ready? So what you're saying is you want me to write a security product? Yes. <laughs> But you know, it does come down to that. You know, if it, if it's your security product that's being the blocker, um, you know, which is the more secure way to go? Dump it, or and and accept that Apple is going to be providing a better security foundation, or rely on your security vendor to just get it done as quickly as possible. I'd say 70, 80 percent of the people in this room have no choice of what security products they're using. Their infosec teams do. So again, it becomes an irrelevant question for a lot of them. But if if it were me, I'd dump them. Yeah. But I, I doubt you and many people in the room actually have the ability to make that call. So. Yeah, it, that is true. But the way to get that call is to start asserting that that security product is the problem, not the operating system. I mean, ultimately, it's a business decision, and this is kind of a, a classic business decision that companies are comfortable with. You gain this value, you have this problem, here's the cost of conversion, here's the difficulty. Businesses can weigh it. The risk, how the risk, it's, it's not binary, right? You can, can we weather the risk for 30 days? And do we have a relationship with that vendor? I mean, there'll be a lot of things that weigh into it, but I definitely agree, you shouldn't be overcommitted to a vendor just because it's easier to install. Ryan? Yeah, so actually we, we ran into a couple issues with Mojave releasing. Oh, I want to be, be on the new one. All right, well, we've been sending out emails for the last two months. We need a week or two to m make it work, right? And so it took us two weeks. But we had mitigations in place, and we sent out playbooks based on, hey, this is how we recommend if you don't want people to upgrade, this is the solution that we have. You know, whether it's adding the uh, installer into your blacklist. So if somebody does download it, it's not going to get installed. Right? So trying to help, like, OK, yeah, we, we still want our security tool in addition to all the other tools that we have to work, um, not just a security tool, but all the others. Right? And this is how we can actually mitigate that from 
them installing that application, right? So just trying to understand what the risks are with other applications and what are the, how can we actually mitigate them from upgrading for the most part? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. Rich Troughton, everyone. I just really want to make him feel awkward, but I'm not, I'm not nailing it. Unlocked. <laughs> Achievement unlocked. Thank you. Next. Done deal. Um, I had my first experience this past year with discovering a hardware keylogger in one of our public labs. Was I mean, it mine? It, it, it did have CE. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so higher education, I'm at Notre Dame, uh, public labs. We have people signing on with their credentials all day long. Um, fortunately, this one turned out to be, after I spotted it, we looked it up, of course, and it was not one of the ones that was accessible over the network. It was just a local storage, which was good, and so we just destroyed it. Um, but it was bad in the fact that it didn't light up anything when it was plugged in. There was no hardware change or anything that showed up. Other than like hiring students to do visual inspection or something like that, what? Uh, <laughs> although the student might have been <laughs> who put it on there, but our students are pretty trustworthy. Um, is there any way to mitigate that? <laughs> Ross, I, I think you should start with this one. You think I should start with this one? Yeah. How many Charles Edge cards do I need to not answer this? <laughs> Got a number? <laughs> okay, I got, like, I got like a few Charles, so. <laughs> no, I can start with it. Um, I think one of the things you could do is just lock out the back USB ports. You, there are devices out there that you'll, you see at stores and stuff that they actually um, have locks that, that are actually are physical locks for the ports. And if it's a key logger, they're, they're trying to hide it. They're not gonna put it in a, in a USB port that's in the front of the machine. Someone's gonna see that, someone's gonna be like, hey, what's this? So I think that's one way to mitigate that risk, is just do that. Or the other, the other way is, of course, because a keylogger is an app, so it's going to eventually, you know, it's going to run. You could blacklist the app that it runs as. I could also write an extension attribute that tells you everything plugged into the machine, and I, I guess build a microservice of all the signatures of what a USB keylogger would look like if I had access to all of them. I mean, you can buy most of them on eBay, so, mm -hmm. you know. It's, I, it's tricky though, a lot of them will show up as keyboards or they'll show up as, as native devices that are, are tricky to detect and then if you move off the local machine, so USB has a number of control options, but if you move on to the network side and you're talking about uh, taps being placed on the physical layer, it's very difficult to detect. It's, uh, you know, if you're on a fiber network, maybe there's some tools for that, but Ultimately, if it's a transparent tap, well designed, there isn't an easy mitigation. My least favorite answer to this question that I've helped implement regrettably at three letter agencies around the world is to super glue the port shut. Hmm. <laughs> Rolling around with a bunch of tubes of super glue makes for a really bad day because it gets, never mind. <laughs> Anyways, I wish I had a better answer for that one too. Security questions can be hard sometimes. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we're always in a constant battle um, with our IT security, battling user experience, ease of use, and then obviously security. Um, one of the key things we're constantly going back and forth on is iCloud Keychain. And fundamentally, it's about helping users be more secure, especially now that there's automatic suggestions and things like this, but of course in an environment where you can sign into any Apple device and set up the services, they're always honest about it. So what, um, what are some of your schools of thought around iCloud Keychain and, and also just in general having these difficult conversations with IT security? So since my answer would normally be get a SSO vendor, I'll punt to Ross. First. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think uh, a lot of it is like the enterprise software, there's a lot of SAML enabled software. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, there are going to be those one offs that you can't, but you can password vault those. Most of those SSO vendors love passwording vault. 
Um, we have iCloud Keychain disabled, and it's one of those things, yeah, we could enable it, but it doesn't really serve any beneficial purpose for us to have it around. It does, uh, if you know, the vendor's not supporting SSO, we're pushing them to support SSO. We're trying to get them to support SSO because we're in enterprise, and that's the, the, the playground we play in. And I think I, I see iCloud Keychain more as a consumer product than, you know, if we're trying to say, well, it's going to be easier for you to use on your phone, then we've probably not built our tool set right. And ultimately, I'd like to disable all of your corporate accounts at once mm -hmm. in Ping, Okta, Azure, et cetera. Um, Aaron, one of the things I like about working with Aaron is he comes from a, a different type of background and often has a much broader answer to certain questions like this, so I'd like to hear your thoughts as well. I think ultimately security is about fundamentals, right? Which means you want visibility and you want control points. You don't necessarily have to take an authoritarian stance on everything and lock everything away. Sure. But a tool like that that cannot be effectively managed, that cannot grant visibility broadly to other enterprise tools, it, it is a bit of a liability. Mm -hmm. um, you know, any other tool, and, and I think Charles hit upon the core piece. Can you assert whether you can remove access to an object from any user? Mm -hmm. And if you can't control that plane, it's, it's a bit of a problem. So assuming that you do have strong identity management and everything is controlled through central authorities that you can turn everything off, um, especially nowadays where people have Apple devices and they use them all the time at their home, at work, and sometimes they use the same device for personal use as time and work use. Um, could it stand to reason that if you do have that ability to um, shut everything down all at once, that you then also enable them to better secure their personal lives by allowing them to have a tool that helps them do that? Yes, and that would be, in my opinion, counterbalanced by the fact that just because you have a good SAML infrastructure in your office mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that all of the uh, departments who spin up their own accounts for sure. Zendesk or you know whatever insert vendor name here right. um, are are actually tied to that SSO. So, okay. Nick, we have policies around that, right? Like if I, I've spun up new services like the Jamf After Dark podcast and then we're like, well, we need to tie that into SSO. Yep. Yeah, we do. I mean, I really do think SSO is the, the best answer for that. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. It doesn't mean everyone's going to actually follow right. the rules. Right. Like me. <laughs> I'm the worst. Yes, sir. Hi. Obviously, every company is a little bit different and they have to make their own decisions about how far they want to go with security. In regards to banking and finance specifically, are there any type of, I guess, not recommendations, but like trends you're seeing as far as how secure banking and finances are going, what controls are putting into place that might be above and beyond what like a school or other institutions that don't have to meet regulatory requirements have to? Yeah, match? I, I, w I would definitely remember um, if you're coming from high security environments, a lot of the higher ed environments that we work with are research funded in some cases, and that research is extremely valuable and sometimes need to, needs to be very well protected. So I've seen a lot of uh, higher ed environments that are more secure than certain banks that I've worked with, but um, Jen, you're actually the best person to answer this. <laughs> um, I would disagree that I'm the best person, but anyway, uh, I do work at a bank. <laughs> But I don't actually interact with the credit cards and bank accounts and the financing information and stuff. Most of that doesn't happen on, on our systems. Um, we have a lot of app developers and um, uh, creative people and, and just developers of all sorts. They are um, sometimes interacting with that important information, but the security is done on the other side. So when they need to, say, run their app and test it and actually get um, sample information back on, say, a person's bank account, all of that's secured on separately by the network team and by the teams that control those things. So I have 
absolutely zero insight into how that works. Um, I was given permission to punt questions like that to my boss who's sitting back there. Um, <laughs> but again, we, we don't have a lot of insight. There's a lot of regulations and a lot of requirements that they have to do to, to keep things. And some of them do apply to us. Um, we don't really get to have the conversation about um, some security software or some network settings or even the local admin things because they're mandated. Um, and when you have auditors that are constantly looking at what you're doing, um, they make a decision, okay, you just don't give uh, local admin to everyone. It applies to all platforms. Um, and so then you work with perhaps an exception process for people who need it. Um, but we start at that kind of across the board. These things have been mandated because of the type of data that you have the potential to access. Um, there's a lot of controls on my machine because I have the potential to um, connect to a system and use my SSO if I have permission and then maybe mount a drive that has a customer information on it. I don't actually know where any of it is, but the potential still exists there. So we have to, we have to make sure that we um, abide by those restrictions about what you can access and make sure we have the SSOs and things like they were talking about to make sure that we don't accidentally do any of that. I think that, uh, <clears throat> I think that these industries that are under really rigorous regulatory oversight, they have a, a big benefit. A lot of security is about selling security to the business. In these cases, they are required legally to have mature security organizations and, and they need, so in banking under the FFIC rules, they need to sustain rigorous audits by smart people and that, that gives them a lot of benefits. So. I'm pretty sure that uh, Nick has responded to some of my emails with SOC 2. <laughs> right. That's it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi there. I'm probably just kind of piggybacking on this, but uh, the company that we work for is tied in the healthcare, so we have to deal with a lot of PHI. And hearing about <coughs> IBM and Jamf having local users as admins or having users as local admins, and the absence of AV is just like so controversial for our organization. And how do you navigate that type of pushback when you when you tell someone? that you don't use AV and everyone's a local admin and they're like, that's impossible, how can you do that? Like, what is your response to that? Like, How do you control access to data? Like, are you allowed to copy data off of public? Well, there's, there's data that has to be transferred. I mean, when you're, well, I guess we work specifically with insurance companies. And so we have to take their- Take a file that they submit. Right, and, yeah. So, I mean, it's just, it seems like every time you bring something up like that to the board, they're just like, no, 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 we can't do that. You have to have trend micro or you have to have limited admin access. And there, there are software tools out there that keep drives from being mounted and things like that or, or control only the types of drives you can mount. Um, but I, I definitely would not want my earlier comment to mean that I don't think that anyone there are definitely certain cases where you don't want people to be admins. Right. And that might be kindergartners, because, and that, that's not malicious, that's just, they're, they're cute little kids, they, you know, they do right. things. Um, when my daughter was in kindergarten, she managed to do lots of things to my computers that I didn't know were possible. Uh, but, you know, there, there are definitely certain cases, and I, you don't want to be responsible for a data breach, right. ever and you don't want to be responsible for putting the ability for some kind of data leakage to occur. Um, someone did mention a lot of this is happening via email. So the, obviously um, good scanning for what's coming in and going out and not allowing something that looks like a social security number to leave a computer mm -hmm. is, is one thing, but would you guys have any other responses to that? Well, I would just say, for the record, um, we do use third-party malware protection, and yeah, obviously we allow local admin use, but that's just our environment, and you know, um, you know, part of what was established early on in the company culture when we were a startup. That obviously isn't something that I, you know, I think anybody would recommend up here. That's for everybody or every industry or every situation. So, mm -hmm. I, I, I think Aaron put it uh, well earlier that it's kind of the 
an age-old thing in InfoSec, like, you know, oh my gosh, no one should be a local admin. And um, so I understand, you know, that still applies in some ways. So I understand that. But. And the question of how, how do you weather regulators or when you're talking to your customers <clears throat> and they say, you know, do you have AV? And you want to say no because you have compensating controls. You have witty next-gen uh, tools that are managing that. And antivirus in its classical sense maybe isn't useful in your environment. That conversation is difficult no matter how mature your organization is. But it's a conversation that you can have and regulators and auditors will understand. And if they don't, I'm afraid there's a lot of companies out there that are running tools on their systems that don't provide them a net security benefit just because there's a regulatory or compliance reason. The checkbox security. I'll, I'll end this uh, with, if it doesn't pass the sniff test of your board, then don't push too hard, you know? You don't want to be the one responsible for turning something off that then ended up leaving you vulnerable, right. I would say. Um, that's all above all of our pay grades, I hope, especially when it comes to my healthcare information leaking out, you know? If you happen to work for one of my providers. <laughs> 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 okay, so no one else jump in line. We will get through everyone in line. We might go over by a couple minutes. Apologies. Um, feel free to leave and go eat lunch if you hate us. That's cool too. <laughs> Next. This question might be a little bit taboo, um, and it's a two part question. The first part is uh, regarding the new MacBooks that have the T2 chip. The taboo part of this is that we do have a couple people that, by preference, have a Mac that I've boot camped, which is not using Gem. Um, obviously, it's boot camped. Um, is there any chance that with this new chip that these machines can be bit locker, do you think? And is there a tool that you that currently exists in security or an antivirus that would be similar to the Windows Defender for Mac where you can mess manage it from the Intune portal? Because I haven't seen anything of that sort as of yet. Um, I, I've got a proof of concept on my laptop I could show. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, really, I do. Um, Anyone? I, I think there's, there's a chance, but any chances, you know, it's, it, a good backup's going to solve that problem. Your data should be backed up regardless. Like, you look at the new Mac as well but with the secure enclave, how you can't actually, you know, take that SSD out of the machine, or you can't desolder from the board and put another machine uh, into another machine because it's not going to work. So, and again, how do you solve that problem? You back it up. So that problem, again, just that's my theory that it's all going to be backed up. You said a two-part question. Yeah. Well, the other one was the security, but the something that can be managed from the Microsoft portal format. Oh. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know of anything off the top of my head that integrates with um, with SCCM or Intune. Okay. Any n mm -hmm. no knowledge of anything coming, right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Next. Uh, hi, uh, I'd be interested to know, uh, particularly for those of you who don't work primarily at a company that does software development, how you accommodate software developers and make sure they can work quickly and build stuff and do the things they need to do while also imposing the security controls that you need to impose on them. So with uh, at least some of the clients that we have are software development companies, especially like that in gaming that have lots of servers compiling a lot of different code. So we have worked with them in the past to do, you know, certain exclusions based on what it is that, hey, how are we, how are we doing this? What I, identifying or, I guess, reducing the landscape that they can actually get um, infected, right? Or um, the vectors that people can come in. So having specific groups and policies based on those unique systems to allow them to do what they need to do. For example, or, yeah, we you know, whitelisted or we're going to suppress any alerts that come from the following directory, for example, because we, we know you're writing code. Unfortunately, it may not be the perfect code, so we may get a false positive, for example. But we, we know that that's happening, and we've, we understand that risk, and that's why we don't want to necessarily, that's why we're suppressing these alerts, for example. But for large gaming companies that we work with, there are, you know, different ways that we've found to, to, to help um, allow them to do their job without
taking any of the resources from those machines that are actually performing this hard work to, so that way they can keep the same compiling times that they have or that they're used to. I've seen everything from we're just scanning what you do um, and not, not trying to remove admin access to I had a customer back before I got to Jamf who had me build them 100 Mac minis for developers in India to tap into to write code. And we secured those Mac minis, you know, but there, there was nothing going back and forth through, through the, the connections that they used to remotely access them. So. I think that's a good point. It's the separation of the environments, right? The more you can separate your user space, which is the primary vector for, say, malware, or those sorts of intrusions, and your development space, where the primary concern is data loss prevention uh, and the rigorousness of those controls. If you can separate those environments as much as possible, uh, you can still allow development users to have lots of rights. A lot of this is layered defense. I was testing uh, some software recently, and someone from Nick's team came, came over, and they were like, so you've downloaded about 100 viruses today. What you doing? <laughs> Do you remember that day? I do. <laughs> <laughs> Hope that helps. Hey, man. Hey. I was told this is the mic for karaoke. Yes, it's okay. keynote karaoke, okay. though. Yeah. I'm All warning right. you. You don't know what, what deck I'm running next. Uh, just a statement on the question of security agents and AV products. Uh, one of my biggest suggestions is every Mac team should be getting an audit a monthly audit report from the security team on the various security agents that they have installed and then use that information to make those informed decisions about whether an agent is valuable or not. And if you don't see anything get triggered in two years, maybe you don't need it. Or Next. You need something that will pick up what it hasn't caught. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> Howdy. Uh, so having conversations about enforced patching, patch management, blocking USB devices is great and all, but what are some strategies that you have for driving that cultural change in your organization? How do you go about dispelling that big brother sentiment? Um, so by patch management, you mean there's a piece of software on your machine, it's out of date, ergo it may have a vulnerability? Well, having a policy within Jamf to do things such as uh, automated um, or enforced uh, flash patches or upgrading to Mojave or whatever it may be, or even just the amount of telemetry that you get outside of Jam. It freaks some users out. Uh, so what are some strategies that you employ to dispel some of those negative views? I let my users see it all. If they wanted to see what was happening on Jam, I let them sit on my computer and click. We weren't hiding anything. Everything how does that was... scale? Pardon? How does that scale? How do you... If, you can't let everyone look there's, at your machine. There, there's not, for, for us, there was, well, I think a good example is when we first put Jaff in, we had about 20 people that were, it's Big Brother, it's Big Brother, are watching you. So that, that 20 people we showed and then they became our advocates. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that saying, no, no, we've seen, we were worried, we've seen what they're doing, we, we're not concerned. I mean, at the end of the day, they also know it's a corporate machine, it's not their personal machine. Anything on that machine is the company's, it's not theirs, right? So mm -hmm. there is that, there is that controversial act that you know you could be looked at at any moment. And my ex-director said it best when he said, uh, "I don't need Casper to look at your machine to see what you're doing. It just made it easier." I really don't want to, unless I'm provoked, right? I'm not going to go. No one's going to go and like look at your machine because you know they they're curious what you're doing. I think that this one goes back to user education again, um, and making sure that you put the right information out there. Um, I think that self-service is a good tool for that. We try and make any updates available there first. Make sure you put information in the descriptions that actually tells the user what it's going to do, not just saying, you must do this now. You should do this because, you know, CVE XYZ was found, or, or go here for more information for the people who really want to look at the details. And also utilizing notifications, letting people know that a change is coming or you should take action before something gets forced upon you. And just to start out in the right place, make sure that self, the fact that self-service exists is told to people when they're onboarding mm -hmm. so they know where they should be looking and so they're not surprised and caught off guard. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Who's hungry? Yeah. 
Get out of here. No, I'm kidding. Thank you so much for joining us and especially those who stayed at the end. Till the end.